when you read something on the internet, that worldwide internet thing they got out there, it's got all that stuff on it. Now, when you read an article, and it might be about anything, it might be about, you know, whether or not to get your dog fixed. Just went through that with Finley. And she's over her surgery now. It might be about anything. How do you know it's true? How do you know? You know, some information we read has really good sources. Some information we read has an agenda. Some information we read is really, really good. You know, it comes from a really accurate place that can help you. Well, how do you know? That's confusing, right? And so you have to kind of check it out if you're smart. You don't immediately call somebody and say, oh my gosh, what you're doing is going to hurt you or what you're doing is, you know, you, you don't do that if you're smart. You source it. You figure out where it falls into the big picture. You look at competing opinions and all of that. Otherwise, we stay stuck in a bubble if we're only listening to the same voices all the time. Well, I'm not talking about the internet here. That's just uh, that's just what my teachers, you know, and I grew up down there in the South, you know, my teachers, I had some good teachers. And they told me, they said, boy, uh, well, actually, that's what my mother would say. She'd say, boy, you can't believe everything you read. All right, well, I'm not talking about reading right now. I'm not talking about the internet. What I'm talking about is the stuff that you are listening to and reading that comes out of your own head. Yeah, because you know what? We listen to the news broadcast in our heads much more than we listen to stuff outside of our heads a lot of times. Now, why do I bring this up? Because remember how I said just listening to the same voices keeps you stuck in a in a circle and a feedback loop? That's one of the problems, you know, you read anywhere. This is true. One of the problems with What's going on everywhere? So people just listen to the same voices all the time. They don't listen to each other, right? They just kind of get stuck in a circle. It's hard to learn. It's hard to grow. It's hard to change. It's hard to make more choices that are more informed. But what if that circle is your head? Then you know what happens? You're just repeating right where you were yesterday. And I'm not saying you in an accusatory way. I'm saying all of us. This is this is this is something I was just thinking about this morning. It's like, you know, with me. Here's what happens. When it is time for you to grow, if you're stuck, if you're trying to solve a problem, or if you're doing something in life, or you're trying to take a step, or you know, whatever it was, a lot of times. Now, there's a technical term for this, you know, in psychology, a lot of the big problem voices come from a, what we call a structure in your head, okay? And if you remember, if you took elementary psychology 101 in the ninth grade, you probably studied Freud, right? Well, Freud gets a bad rap, obviously, he's, he was in the very beginning, you know, he didn't have anybody else to talk to. He discovered a lot of stuff and some of it's not right, but I tell you what he did do is he gave us something that never had really been done before. He gave us a structural view is what informed psychologists call it a structural view of personality. In other words, that our personalities, we grow up and it's like building a house and we have different parts to the structure. Well, if you remember in Psych 101, the what sits at, you know, kind of like the policeman, <laughs> the air traffic control, you know, the, the parent in your head, he called it the superego, all right? And that was a structure that basically had all the prohibitions in it, had all the messages in there. Don't do that. That's bad. Don't you think that? That's bad. Okay, and what that did, you know, was it kind of kept people in check. Oh, I want to go do A, B, C, or D. And the superego says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
All right. Well, that's what he called it. You go on later, you know, throughout the history of psychology and you see all sorts of models coming from exactly saying the same thing. You've got, you know, way back in the 60s, if you go back and read the history books that far, you had a big school really took off, which made this kind of more popular called transactional analysis. And what that was, it said that we have three parts to our personality. We have the parent, the adult and the child living in our heads all the time. And the adult was the one that actually makes informed decisions, right? The parent sits up there and might just be repeating. Inhibitions are good, by the way. We're not against having rules in your head. If you don't, you, you will step off the curb when the car's coming. But some of this parent stuff in your head is goofball inhibitions that have a very particular tone to them and the thing about this you can call it conscience you know the scriptures talk about this a lot and in a couple of various forms you know the same thing that psychology has noticed which by the way psychology is always going to good research and good psychology is always going to validate the design that god made i mean hello you know if you if you go out and buy a car and you find one on the road and somebody's, you know, never seen a car like that and, and they tinker with toys, they look in there, and, oh, here's how it works. And they write articles about that. Well, you could have gotten the manufacturer's manual. That's in my view what the Bible is. And it's all going to agree if it's, you know, if it's accurate, it's going to agree. Well, here's what the deal is that a lot of times that, uh, that structure, you know, the Bible refers to it as a conscience, and sometimes it refers to it as traditions of the elders. That's something Jesus said. He said, look, you guys are living according to the traditions of your elders. Basically, I'm going to paraphrase it, crap that lives in your head that people before you put in your head, and now you're obeying it as if it's true, okay? It also says in the scriptures that you can have an immature or a weak conscience that condemns you for stuff that is perfectly okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about the big elephant in the room. Usually when people get into this, sex. Sex is a great example. If you look at, at some of the, the attitudes and the, and, and the judgment, the condemnation, and you know, people couldn't even, even talk about it because oh that's bad oh that's bad oh that's bad you know because of the traditions of their elders well finally you know the at least the the church community got over that at some point and here we are people of faith we talk about sex how about that Ooh. because if you go to the scriptures it says it's a good thing right now it gives us some guidelines but it says it's a good thing well i'm not just talking about sex i'm talking about voices in your head that keep you from making the next step that you need to make that is good. It's a good thing. But you're listening to news in your head that stops you. Remember the elephant? Story of the elephant? What do they do? You go to the circus, you see the elephant. Big old elephant sitting there with a rope around its ankle and a stake in the ground. Doesn't move. Why didn't it move? The elephant can pull the whole tent down. Well, he didn't know that. Because he was a baby elephant. They put that stake in the ground. They put a chain on it. And he couldn't move. It was in concrete. And he learned to listen to that voice. And now he carries it in his head when there's no concrete. And he still obeys it when he could go run free and, and go up to the popcorn stand, get all the popcorn he wants. Cotton candy, peanuts. Johnny's iPhone. That elephant could have a grand old time with that trunk. He could just reach out there in life and get a lot of stuff that tastes very good to him. And our lives are like that as well, but not if we're tied to the stake. So let me give you one little example of this that you probably can really, really, a lot of you identify with. Let's just take the word no. All right somebody that you really care about and they might be controlling or they might not be controlling if the voice in your head is strong enough 
they ask you to do something or they want you to do something and you really don't want to do it. It's not good for you. The adult, if you ever listen to it in, in our heads, would tell you it's perfectly fine to say no to that. You don't have to do that. If they're disappointed, that's their problem. But, you know, you don't you don't have to go to that dinner. You don't have to go do that. You got something to do that day. OK, so you want to say yes. But guess what? You read the news and the news in your head. The broadcast says, no, 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 you can't do that. Because if you if you say no, if you say no to that, that's bad. You're bad. You're selfish. And the voices start to say things like, you know, all you ever do is think about yourself. You know, that person really needs this or. How could you disappoint mama or how, whatever it is. And the voice in your head is strong and you listen to it and it is wrong. Need to go past the initial first page on the search. Because what's going to come up on the first page of a Google search or any other search is, you know, the stuff they're either feeding you or the stuff that is the most popular or whatever. When you go further deeper into the pages, you're going to find some stuff that's buried. And that sometimes is like your head, that there's some other stuff in there that you need to follow that would negate that voice. So here's what I want you to think about. What in your life are you being inhibited to do that is perfectly okay to do in the sight of God, who is the real super ego we need to listen to, right? What is it? You want to step out and like, maybe you want to change jobs. I was working with a guy not long ago. Very, very, very successful um, Worked in a in a really good business, you know, close to his team. Had been doing it. He was probably thirty or so. Been doing it for a while. Very invested in his company. Loved the people. And here's what happened. He just happened to come into, um, you know, one of those people that gets to inherit a, <laughs> a bunch of stuff. Um, didn't happen to me, but it happens to some people. And all of a sudden, he doesn't have to work anymore. And he starts to really get in touch. Now, this is going to apply to you. I know you're not in that context, probably. Not many of us are. But it illustrates a point. All of a sudden, he doesn't have to do what he's doing because of his, you know, you got to pay the mortgage or the rent. He didn't have to do that anymore. And he starts to dream. He starts to think about, you know, I've always wanted to A, B, C, or D. And I said, why don't you do it? He goes, I don't know. I just, I, I can't disappoint my boss. And, you know, I've been there for a while. The team really depends on me and, and, and all of this, all this stuff, which is really, really beautiful. I mean, I want people always concerned about others and how our choices affect others. But, there's no, that's not a bad thing for somebody to pursue a dream and have to leave a job and leave a team and leave people that are going to be sad or bummed or even, you know, kind of like, oh, crap, what do we do now to see him go? Okay. It causes some distress in some other people, as do many, many choices that we are free to make because not everybody around us always gets us in the way that they want us. There's nothing wrong with making your choices that are not injurious or you're not trespassing any oracle of God, but the voice in your head might be keeping you from doing that. That's what I'm talking about. Or taking a risk. You know, maybe... I remember one, one time I worked with who was in a, had a, her husband was just mean. And after 20 years, you know, and she, she worked at home. She had, um, when they got married, she left the, the workforce. She was a very smart lady and left the workforce because she wanted to be with her kids, which, uh, you know, is a great choice that, you know, a lot of people make. And she did that until, Empty nest time. 
well, that was her plan. You know, she chose it. It was good. But all along the way, he was mean. And he called her stupid. And he put her down. He said, you can't, you know, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You wouldn't make it without me, blah, 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 blah. Well, then he figures out, <laughs> this is where he should have listened to some voice that wasn't in his head. He figures out that he would trade her in for a, you know, <sighs> for a new model after 20 plus years of marriage and he left her betrayed her and abandoned her and she finds herself now as an empty nester um, and abandoned and divorced and it's time for her to build a new life well she had this dream and we started to talk about it and she wanted to do some things this was this she particularly she was in the world of design but it's going to require <clears throat> taking a, you know some courses as well before she did that. So I'm trying to get her to you know take this step. Well, every time she would think about taking the step, she go, "No, I'm too stupid. I'm not even going to get accepted. Nobody's going. To, the school's not going to accept me at my age, and I'm too dumb." And blah 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 blah. And so I said, "Look, one day I said, you know what? We're not going to listen to that voice any." anymore there's the phone you call the admissions office right now and you just get the application that was the first step you know she literally started to shake well she did it we did the next step we did the next step voices screaming all the time she's not listening to those searches anymore those voices in her head those broadcasts her husband's voice in her super ego she's not listening to that anymore and she takes a step and she takes a course and she gets there and the professors are enamored with her work and the way she thinks. Long story short, she ended up building a great career and just a whole new life. But if she had listened to the voice in her head that was inhibiting her and stopping her from doing something that there was nothing wrong with doing, what if she failed? So what? All of us have failed that have ever tried anything. If you hadn't failed, you probably hadn't tried enough. I mean, that just goes without saying, right? So what voice is in your head? Is it saying no to in-laws, maybe, to friends, to somebody at church is leaning on you to give more time or give somebody money or just saying, I don't like that or whatever. I want you to monitor those voices. And then I want you to do what the Bible says do. And it says, don't automatically believe them. Question them, compare them to other websites. <laughs> Start with the scriptures. They'll give you a lot of freedom in there. There's a lot of freedom. You're not going to get inhibited from doing anything good in there. And you're also going to see where it says you are being inhibited from doing a lot of things good, either by fear of failure or lack of faith or not thinking that you have the abilities when God has designed you to go do good things or not thinking you have the freedom to disappoint somebody. I want you to listen to those voices in your head so you can have a conversation with them and learn to not believe them and take them off of their lofty throne and put them down in conversation say, I don't know if I believe that. Why isn't it okay if I do this? Listen to the voices, why? So you can stop listening to them, a lot of them. And remember, this is very broad, and I know there's some drop-down windows to this, but it's just like I told my kids when they got to be teenagers. I said, look, my biggest goal for you over the next, while you're teenagers, the last thing I want to do is control you. I want you guys to have 100% freedom, and their eyes are this big. I said, because I am too busy to be in control of two teenage girls. I don't want to do that. So here's how it's going to work. I don't want to control you. I want you to have self-control. Self-control. Because I'm not going to be there a lot of times, <laughs> wherever you are. And you've got to be in control of yourself. Now, here's the formula. Freedom. That's what I want you to have. Freedom. 
equals responsibility equals love. So what does that mean? I want you to be free to do what you choose to do. But the way you're going to get that freedom and have that freedom is you're going to measure it by, am I being responsible and making responsible choices? And how are you going to know whether or not those choices are responsible? Well, you're going to measure it by love. I don't want you doing anything that's destructive to you or to anybody else. And if all three of those are equal, then you're going to have a world of great choices available to you. But a lot of people don't have that freedom because what they're thinking about doing is responsible and it's not unloving, but the voice in their head says it is. Afraid of failure, afraid of disappointing somebody, afraid, you know, whatever it is, listen to those voices so you can discuss them and measure them with a formula. Is this okay? To feel okay, doesn't matter. In fact, the scriptures teach us over and over and over that some things feel bad to some people that God says are perfectly okay. And there's lots of passages that talk about that. So, do a broader search than just the voice in your head. All right, you're gonna find a lot of freedom, find a lot of growth, take that next step. As long as it's not destructive to you or somebody else, chances are it might be okay.